Unfortunately for me, I am haunted by TED Talks. I've given a few of them, and two in particular were to do with one with reading the Quran and the other with Muhammad himself. And everybody then thinks that I speak as fluently and as uh, oratorically perfectly as I do in those talks. That is impossible because I should tell you that TED Talks are edited. They take out all the flubs, they take out all the, uh, what was it I meant to say? They take out all the, no, wrong way around and so on. They light it all perfectly and so on. So you come out looking just splendid instead of real. So I'm sorry to tell you that tonight you've got the real me. Uh, okay, but this is how I began the TED Global Talk, which was in 2013. Writing biography, I said, is a pretty strange thing to do. It's a journey into the foreign territory of somebody else's life. An exploration that can take you places you never imagined going and still can't quite believe you've been. Especially if, like me, you're an agnostic Jew and the life you've been exploring is that of Muhammad. But then I didn't really go on to tell just how strange it was. So I'd like to talk about that just a little bit tonight. Because you see, I know everybody thinks that um, I wrote After the Prophet, which really is an epic story of the split between Shia and Sunni and how it happened in the first 50 years after the death of Muhammad. They think that I wrote that after the life of Muhammad, wrong way around, it was the other way around. I'd never have dared I've never have had the, in Yiddish it's called the chutzpah, the gall, the cheek, to just go straight into the life of Muhammad. In fact, I said no when somebody suggested it. In fact, I laughed. I <laughs> said, are you kidding me? But then came up this question of how come the Shia Sunni split had, had, how did this begin? Why were people still actually killing each other over it? And that was the question that I went into for the next four years. And then the moment, that, that book, of course, starts with the death of Muhammad. And then the moment I finished that, that's when I knew I was ready, finally, to write the life of Muhammad. But I wrote on After the Prophet, the first book, under the radar, as it were, which is how writers always work, you know. It's not like we announce to the world that we're going to write a book and then sit down and write it with the world looking over our shoulder. We sort of stay, you know, we're alone inside four walls with all our books, our research sort of weighing down, you know. I live on a houseboat, so you can always tell it's a raft, it's a shack built on a raft in Seattle. So you can always tell when I'm really into research because it feels like half the University of Washington Research Library is on my floor. So many piles of books that the whole raft goes lower and lower and lower in the water. And then when I finish the book, I give all the books back and the raft rises in the water again. But um, the first Muslim was different. And it, the, the, it, it, I blame TED Talks. Because what happened was that the first talk I gave, it was a TEDx talk, a local TED Talk, at Benaroya Hall in Seattle. It was a favor to a friend. I had no idea then what TED Talks were. For those who don't know, it's, uh, it's T. TED, T-E-D, stands for Technology, Entertainment, and I always forget the D. What is the D? Huh? Design, thank you. Right. Technology, Education, and Design. None of which, Entertainment and Design, none of which actually apply to me. So um, <laughs> it's no wonder I hadn't heard of them. And uh, she persuaded me to do a nine-minute talk. She knew that I was beginning the biography of Muhammad. And she said, how would you like to give you know, a nine-minute talk on the biography of Muhammad? And I said, yeah, no. <laughs> no, no, no. Nine hours, maybe, but nine minutes, no way. But then I just finished <coughs> reading the Quran in as much detail as I could, a project that I thought would take three weeks. And in fact, as some of you know, it took three months. And um, I realized, okay, maybe that would be a nine minute TED talk. Uh, and I mentioned in the TED talk that the reason I was reading the Quran this way was because I was writing a biography of Muhammad and it seemed 
the matter of the most basic respect that I study the words we could be most sure he actually said, most sure actually came out of his mouth as closely as I could. Uh, and as far as I was concerned, I was talking to a few hundred people in this hall in Seattle. And I knew there were cameras there, but I didn't really pay any attention because I hate cameras. I've got these cameras here too. And uh, in any case, the lights were very bright and I couldn't see them. So I wasn't quite aware that this was going to go online. Uh, I wasn't that much online myself. But in any case, it went online. And an awful lot of people apparently started watching it. So many people started watching it, the big TED, TED.com, decided to put it on their site. And then it went completely viral. And this was um, a very strange experience because it had never occurred to me that the words Leslie Hazelton and viral could go together in the same sentence. Uh, you can laugh at that, it's okay. <laughs> it, was, it was just totally surreal. Uh, but what this meant was that I sat down to write The First Muslim with what felt like one and a half billion Muslims looking over my shoulder. When I say what felt like it is that I was getting an, hundreds and hundreds of emails and comments on Facebook and so on, all very concerned that I get it right attaching very often in email various tracts written by their teachers and their, their you know, uh, and, uh, and preachers whom they admired, urging me to read them, and um, deeply theological tracts. And I know I call myself, the blog is called The Accidental Theologist, but a theologist is very different from a theologian. Uh, we study it, but we don't actually do it. So, um, but I understood the concern, and it was a very, very deep concern. And the concern was that, you know, there has been so much written in attack of Muhammad, and he is so revered and so loved by Muslims that they were really concerned that I would uh, do a bad job. And I couldn't actually assure them that I would do a great job. All I could do, and I did reply to everyone, and I said, you know, I truly understand your concern. But please understand that I'm an outsider. I'm writing this book from the outside. So how I write about Muhammad will not be the way you yourself would write about Muhammad, and not necessarily even the way you would like to read about him. I'm writing mainly for non-Muslims. I am an agnostic Jew. I'm trying to come to my subject, with, obviously, with respect, because why else would I be spending all this time studying him, uh, but from my point of view. So please just believe me when I say that I come to it in good faith uh, and that my intentions are good, though I do realize how limited good intentions can be. Um, and the responses were amazing. I, 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 people would reply, first of all, they seemed to be surprised that I'd replied in the first place. And secondly, they said, Inshallah, you'll, you'll do it well. You know, they, they, they place their faith in me, uh, which was very moving. Uh, but still, every morning, I would sit down at my desk. There I was in 21st century Seattle with the mist rising off the lake that my houseboat is on. And I'd sit down at my desk to 7th century Mecca and Medina, which was actually a wonderful feeling because it felt like I was, you know, spanning half the world and almost half of history. It was amazing just to be able to do that. I have, by the way, there's an olive tree on my deck just to remind me of the Middle East, just to keep it close in Seattle. Um, and all those books and piles on the floor. But still, every time I sat down at my desk every morning, I had to sort of take off those, well, not one and a half billion, but all those people who were so concerned that I would get it right. I would have to sort of like taking off a shirt and sort of hanging it on a hook behind me and I would say, I'm sorry, I cannot do this with you looking over my shoulder. You just have to really have faith that I will do my best. And if you want to come back and criticize what I write afterwards, 
that's okay. But first of all, I've got to do it, and I've got to do it my way. They weren't the only people, though, that were concerned. There was a whole other bunch of people who were concerned, and that was my non-Muslim friends in Seattle. Words like fatwa kept on being thrown about, right? They were really concerned, you know, because there's been so much stereotyping of Muslims where, you know, one and a half billion Muslims get stereotyped by the actions of a very small, very loud, and very ugly minority. Uh, and they were as liable to these stereotypes as anyone else. They said, what if there's a fatwa on you? And I thought, oh, please, just <laughs> relax. <laughs> Uh, and um, but they were, they, you know, they also were truly and sincerely concerned. And they said, "Are you sure you know what you're doing?" And the answer was actually, "Yes, I do know what I'm doing." I want to ask what I call the deceptively simple question. Such a simple question, isn't it? Who was he? So simple. Who was he really? Who must he have been? How did this one man radically change not only his world, but the whole of history? Uh, and I wanted to do it in a way that accorded him the integrity of a full life lived. I didn't want to edit him. I didn't want to censor him. I wanted to see him as fully as I could in, as a three-dimensional man. And I wanted to do this particularly because I had read a lot of biographies of him by then. And they fell into various types. You know, there were the ones, there were the, well, the, there were the pious, devout biographies, which if you are a pious, devout Muslim, work. But if you're not, you just go, um, no, right? It felt like there wasn't a real person there. Then there were the academic biographies. Well, I've said the word academic, so you can imagine that I've read a lot. I've read just about all of the academics for this book, but um, they're very hard to read, let's just put it like this, and very dry. There's no sense of story there. Now, I come, I come to it as a writer and as a psychologist. And as a writer, I can see a magnificent story that is not to my lights, to my mind, being told, well, certainly not for a Western non-Muslim audience. I can see an incredibly dramatic life. How did he do it? How did this man born to the mar in the margins of his own society? I know he was a member of the Quraysh tribe, but he was orphaned before he was even born. His father died before he was born in a society where you were defined by your father. He was farmed out to the Bedouin, but I mean, he was the last one taken, you know, to be a wet nurse with the Bedouin. Because who wanted to take him? Because there was nobody to pay the Bedouin the fee. There was no father there. The grandfather, al Mutalib was also not paying. The uncle was not paying. It was just basically the Bedouin woman who took him, Halima, took him out of pity. And usually kids who were farmed out to the Bedouin for wet nursing because it was healthier, because, you know, Mecca was, you know, people were concerned about plague, about illness. You know, it was a, a town with very narrow alleys. Um, so there's, there was this awareness that, you know, for a child to be weaned out among the Bedouin in the desert was much healthier. But usually they were brought back after two years. Muhammad stayed with his Bedouin foster family for five years. And I started asking why? How come so long? Why was there nobody to take him back in Mecca? And then when he finally did come back, his mother was still not married again, which was very, very unusual at the time. By the laws of the time, her husband, her dead husband's, at least her dead husband's, one of his brothers should have married her, should have brought her back into the family in order to look after her and the child. And that hadn't happened. Something here was very wrong. The system of, this whole social system of Mecca was breaking down. And I could feel this, I could see this. Uh, the profit motive had 
P-R-O-F-I-T. The profit motive had taken, had taken control. And all the, the old tribal values where you look after the poor, you look after the weakest member of the tribe because the tribe was defined by its weakest member, which is going by the wayside. He comes back a year later, his mother died. He's now doubly orphaned. He's put to work as a camel boy on the caravans. I mean, he really is in the margins. And one way or another, he works himself up. Very slowly, he becomes the Amin, the one whose judgment is respected, the one who can be relied on, the one whose word is absolutely trusted, and so on. And though he doesn't become a senior member of Mecca, he becomes respected. And he marries this wonderful woman, Khadija. Right? She proposes to him. Because he can't propose to her. Not only is he younger than her, he's, he's poor. She's wealthy, right? twice a widow. They marry. It's an extraordinary marriage, a marriage of great respect and of great love. And this is what Westerners, you know, who know all about the nine one late life wives, whom he married after Khadija died, they don't seem to realize that, that, that this was a, this loving monogamous marriage lasted 24 years until her death. And you can see, you can see the love of that marriage in what happened that night when he had the first revelation on Mount Hera. Because here is this man at 40 years old. His life has turned out infinitely better than he could ever have expected as a child, as an orphan child. He's now respected in his community in Mecca. He's married to a woman he loves and who loves him. They have four beautiful daughters. No son, which will turn out to be a problem, but not yet. And yet he's up there on the mountain in meditation. Now what was he doing up there on the mountain? Right? Was he in retreat? as many people do still today, just hoping for you know, a moment of peace, and perhaps a little, a moment of insight, perhaps a small epiphany. I don't know, who can know? But I, I do know from his response to what happened on that night. And his response is there in the earliest Islamic biographies, in the Sirah of Ibn Ishaq, repeated again in the Tariq of Al-Tabari. So the earliest Islamic biographies, we have Muhammad's own account of what happened that night. And it is clear that that first revelation of the Quran was not only soul-rending, but also physically rending. His account of it, it reads almost like, this is what struck me so strongly, it, my father had open-heart surgery twice. And it felt like open, reading about open heart surgery without anesthetic. Just this immense weight, this vast fear, this feeling that he could not possibly stand it anymore. In fact, he would later say that he never had any revelation come to him without feeling that he, he just didn't have the strength to take it anymore. Uh, God talks to a human. I mean, this giant barrier has been broken. And he is terrified. So, you know, what you would expect if this were hagiography, if this were sort of, you know, the usual kind of, you know, the account of a saint or something like this, what you would expect was that Muhammad receives the first revelation of the Quran up on Mount Hira, five verses, and says, Hallelujah, comes down the mountain, sort of, you know, radiating light, halo, and so on, and choirs of angels, you know, ethereal. <laughs> songs and so on, saying, I have it, I have the truth, this is it, you know, I bring you the good news, right? I bring you the gospel, which is what gospel means, good news. And that's not at all what happened. What happened instead was utterly, utterly human. It just smacked to me, as a psychologist, of reality. What happened was that he was so terrified, he thought he was losing his mind. And his first impulse was that, out of shame that he had gone mad, he was going to throw himself off the highest peak and kill himself. 
And I'm not making this up. It's there in Ibn Ishaq, and it's there again in Al-Tabari. And then the angel Gabriel appears and says, no, this is real. Right? But that's not much consolation, because just, just imagine a human being on a mountaintop. God speaks to him. I don't even care if you believe that the words he heard were those that came out from outside him were actually the words of God, as every believing Muslim does, or as many non-Muslims do, that it came from inside him and that he interpreted it as the word of God. In fact, mystics would say there's no difference between the two, that God is inside you anyway. But that doesn't make any difference to me in any case. Because what was clear to me was that Muhammad did experience these words. Experience them, he said, like they were engraved, being engraved on my heart while he was conscious. That's how deep they went. He came running down that mountain in terror and in awe and in fear. He came running down that mountain as fast as he could and he ran for the one person, the one person to whom he could tell, to whom he could, with whom he could find comfort from this terror that he experienced. And that one person was Khadija, his wife. And he runs in, and he buries his head in her lap, and he says, cover me, cover me with your shawl. I think I have lost my mind. And she does, and he tells her what happened. And she then says the most wonderful thing. She doesn't say hallelujah. She doesn't say, you are the prophet of God. She says, I think you may be the prophet of God. I think you may be the prophet of this people. And I love those two conditionals. I think you may be. There's no certainty there. There's no absolutism there. But it's just, isn't that human? The reassurance of that? And then, what follows then? And again, so human. So you think, okay, if this were just you know, a regular story, story. The revelations, first revelation has come, now all the rest will come. There'll just be this flow of revelation, one after the other, the word of God being revealed. Not what happens. Look in the Quran, not what happens. Two years pass. Two years. Two years in which after what's happened on that mountain, Muhammad cannot go back to his business as a, as a trader, as a representative of, of a, you know, a trading agent. I mean, how can you after something like that has happened? He spends two years trying to come to terms with it, struggling with it, wrestling with it, wondering why is God not speaking to him again? Why is he not hearing that voice again? Feeling more and more abandoned, and abandonment especially goes deep for someone who's been doubly orphaned in childhood. And then finally, finally comes the second revelation, which is called the revelation of the morning, which starts off, no, Muhammad, we have not forgotten you. We have not abandoned you. And that this is just all, to me, this all smacks of reality. This is where these two events, this is where I see Muhammad real. This is what made him real for me. More than anybody telling me what a great man he was, more than anybody telling me how devoutly they believed that he was the prophet of Islam, this, these very, very human reactions, this is what made him real for me, allowed me to begin to see him as a human being, as a real historical figure. And yes, I have no doubt as to the historical reality of that night on Mount Hera, because the psychology of it is so true. Uh, and this is what I was looking for all the time while I was writing. How long have I been speaking now? I don't want to go on too long because the most interesting stuff is not me rambling on, it's you. It's your questions and my attempts at response because sometimes the questions are so 
deceptively simple that I actually have no answers. Um, but you know, okay, the, the, let me just go into, let me skip everything else I had ready here. <laughs> let me just go into one, one aspect of Muhammad that many non-Muslims, especially today in the West, focus on. And they see him and they see Islam, by extension, as a religion of war, which I think is the most absurd way to talk about any religion. No, I do not think Islam is a religion of peace. Neither do I think it's a religion of war. I do not think Judaism is a religion of peace or a religion of war or Buddhism or Hinduism or Christianity. I do not think that these are terms in which it makes any sense at all to think of a religion. Because those who are warlike right, will use religion as their excuse. Those who are peaceful will find in their religion the impulse to be peaceful. In other words, we bring ourselves to religion. It's we who make religion. And if we are violent and ugly, and full of hate, we will bring that to religion and we will interpret our religion in that way. And if what we want is to live with each other in peace, we will find that in our respective religions and we will come together in peace. So, let me just tell you my favorite verse from the Quran, which is here somewhere. Huh. Some of these verses, it says, are definite in meaning, and others are ambiguous. The perverse at heart, there's plenty of those around these days, aren't there? The perverse at heart will eagerly pursue the ambiguities, trying to create discord by pinning down meanings of their own. Only God knows the true meaning. And I love that. The Quran is infinitely more subtle than many people seem to imagine. So this really is something to bear in mind next time somebody you know, thumps a Bible or waves a Quran around in the air and says, this is what it says. And that phrase, God is subtle, appears several times in the Quran. Excuse my Arabic pronunciation, but in Arabic, Allah latifun khabir. And in fact, the whole of the Quran is far more subtle. And this is an essential part of its power. It contains the awareness that things can't be stated directly. The divine cannot be stated directly. That the divine is beyond direct human apprehension. And it can only be expressed through metaphor. And metaphor, the poetry of metaphor is what allows the mind, the human mind, to expand, to roam, to explore, to soar. And this is why fundamentalism is not only dangerous, it's dull. It's so dull because it sticks to the literal meaning of things. And when I talk about fundamentalism, I'm not only talking about Muslim Islamic fundamentalists, I'm also talking about Jewish fundamentalists, Christian fundamentalists, Buddhists, Buddhist fundamentalists, Hindu fundamentalists, all those people who insist that there is only a single meaning and what else do they do? They cherry pick. You know what it is to cherry pick? You just pick the cherries you want off the tree. You say the Quran is a tree. You just pick this cherry or that cherry. I call it the highlighter version of the Quran. I take in one of those yellow highlighters and you just mark the phrases that you want to mark, that you want to use. And you ignore all the rest. And of course, you take them out of context. So what I want to get to um, and then I will open it up to the floor, except it will take me 10 or 15 more minutes to get to it. I'm sorry. <laughs> what I want to get to is um, one phrase that is used by both Muslim fundamentalists and by Islamophobes, who really are partners in crime, so far as the Quran is concerned because they use exactly the same highlighter phrases. They sort of shout them back and forth at each other, right? Here's one, I'll give you this one. No, I'll give you that one and raise you this one and so on. That's all they ever read of the Quran. So let's talk about what they call the sword verses. 
I guess I don't need to tell you that there's no swords in the sword verses, but never mind. And the sword verses I read completely out of context because the Quran actually doesn't give you context. The Quran is written in the, the voice of God speaking to Muhammad, telling him what to tell everybody else. And, you know, why should God give context? And it's also sort of taken for granted that people, the people to whom Muhammad is talking, will know what he's talking about. Partly because many of the revelations came in response to questions from his followers. So I'm talking now about the time, and the year is 630. This is eight years after Muhammad has been exiled from Mecca. And yes, I mean exiled. For 12 years after that first revelation, he obeyed the command of the Quran and said the verses, repeated the verses, preached them in Mecca. This did not make him popular because what he was saying was, it was a plea for social justice, basically. It was an argument against the oligarchy and against the greed and against the corruption that was running the city. It was an argument to take care of the needy, of the orphaned, of widows, of slaves, of freed slaves, of everybody who was shut out. Basically, it was an argument of the 99% against the 1% who were running the city and making a huge profit of it. Profiting, by the way, from piety. Profiting from the fact that Mecca was a center of pilgrimage called the Hajj, pre-Islamic. All the pre-Islamic tribes would come there. It was a major pilgrimage center. So, you know, the powers that be responded as powers that be will when they are challenged. They forced him out of Mecca under pain of death. And he founded a whole new community in Medina based on the principles of equality, social justice, economic justice. And over the next eight years, there were three, they're called battles. By those who like to fight, they're called battles. They're even called great battles between Mecca and Medina. They weren't. They were skirmishes. And certainly two of them were started unintentionally because everybody was doing everything they could to avoid them. Uh, but in any case, peace clearly had to be made between the two cities. Medina was becoming more powerful under Muhammad, who had actually united all the tribes of that, of that city. So what happened was a negotiated, a negotiated return of Muhammad to Mecca, negotiated with those who were now in power in Mecca, who had opposed him, who had been his most bitter enemies. They sat down with him outside the city and they negotiated his return. So his followers were all, wow, wonderful. But they say, well, you know, but there's still some people who oppose this agreement, who oppose this negotiation. So what happens if we walk in there and they attack us? It's meant to be a, you know, a city where nobody attacks anybody. It's a holy city because it has the shrine in it and so on. But what happens nonetheless if they attack us? And here's what the revelation says. It says, yes, you may kill the unbelievers. And that's all you hear, isn't it? Just that phrase. That's the one the Islamophobes use, and that's the one the Islamist extremists use. Here's, the, here's what follows after. Yes, you may kill the unbelievers, but only if they attack you first, and only if they try to stop you reaching the Kaaba, the shrine, and only if the truce we now have in place falls through, and only if no other truce is in place or can be negotiated, then you may. And I was fascinated by this, fascinated to find the whole of it there. You didn't even know, need to go to the histories to find the context. It was right there in the Quran. And I was also fascinated because there was something in there of a phrase, you know, 
my mother used to use, which was, you know, better if you don't. And this is so typical of the whole way Muhammad preached, of the whole way the Quran approaches so many questions. It's not trying to change. It's not trying to impose change. Of course, it's trying to change. It's not trying to impose change on the pre-Islamic tribes. It's respecting their traditions. It recognizes that change is hard. It's not trying to force change, which is why two of the words most used in the Quran are think and consider. Think this, consider this, think about it, you know. Maybe better if you don't. And this comes up again and again. And by the way, what did Muhammad do after the Fatah, which for those who like battles instead of skirmishes is often translated as the conquest of Mecca. It's a total mistranslation. Fatah is, Fatah is opening. It's the opening of Mecca to Muhammad and to Islam. And what does he do? He doesn't take the throne. He doesn't take charge. He doesn't demand submission from everybody. He doesn't have them parading in front of him, pleading, you know, pledging allegiance to him. He says, good. And he appoints all his former enemies, his top former enemies now, as his top aides, right? And as the administrators of Mecca. And he goes back to Medina, and two years later he dies. And I think that says it all. The way, the way he, this man who has the reputation of being violent, in fact, when you actually read both the Quran and the early histories, did all he could to avoid violence. The way he negotiated, the way he tried to include, the way he did not impose his beliefs or his message, but try to persuade constantly. And what is astonishing is that he succeeded. This to me is the most astonishing thing, that in 12 years, no, sorry, not 12 years. First Revelation is 610, 22 years. It took him 22 years. But he died having achieved what he was told to achieve that first night on Mount Hera. That is truly astonishing. Um, I'd just like to stop there and say, um, <laughs> just say it's an honor to be here. It's a total delight to be in Sri Lanka. It's, um, it's an honor to speak with the Compassion Initiative. And it's exciting to see people from so many faiths and so many strands within each faith coming together. Because that's where we have real power. That's it's when we come together that we can stand up against the nutcases and the fundamentalists in our own faiths and in our own traditions. It's then that we can find a common voice that says, no, not in our name. No, you do not speak for us. No, what you are doing is an obscene travesty of everything we hold dear. It's an obscene travesty of everything Muhammad held dear, and it's an obscene travesty of the very idea of God. So let me just finish with this, and then we'll open it up. Because this is real chutzpah. Chutzpah, the Jewish thing, this is Gaul. But I am pretty sure that after keeping, after having kept daily company with Muhammad as a writer for five years, the five years it took me to write the first Muslim, I cannot see that Muhammad himself would be anything but utterly outraged by the militant extremists who claim to act in his name today. I cannot see that he'd be anything but appalled at the repression of half the population, the female half of the population because of their gender. 
I cannot see that he'd be anything but dismayed at the bitter divisiveness of sectarianism. He would call out terrorism for what it is, not only criminal, but the most obscene travesty of everything he believed in and struggled for. And he'd say what the Quran says. Anyone who takes a life takes the life of all humanity. Anyone who saves the life saves the life of all humanity. And he would commit himself, as I know many people here today have already done, fully to tolerance, to inclusiveness, to social and civic justice, and to the very hard and very thorny process of making peace. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. That was, yeah, that was really amazing. Thank you so much. So you kept us going for a good 45 minutes, I have to tell you. Wonderful job. No. <laughs> I apologize. I apologize. Once I get going, I know it's hard to stop me. I can talk for 24 hours about Muhammad, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll just make one comment and then open the, open the floor for questions. We have until about 8.30 for questions. So be as brief as possible, please, and no long commentaries, brief questions. Uh, the first thing I wanted to say was that I really appreciated, of course, the, um, you know, the illustration of you know, the kinds of uh, misinterpretations uh, and the sort of the misquoting of the Quran and all of that. That's greatly appreciated. But what really struck me, Leslie, is the way in which you humanized the prophet. And that's, I really appreciated that. But you humanized him without taking away the enormity of the contact with the divine. I thought that was just amazingly done by you. Thank you so much for that. So um, that's just a comment from me. For uh, the rest of the audience, now we open it up, and you know you can ask her your questions. Yes. Yes. Leslie, to write about him, what made you pick on when you had so many other things you could have written on? I'm just baffled. Well, like I said, okay, I'd written a biography of Mary. Right. Uh, in fact, the subtitle was a flesh and blood biography. Um, and there's a long story how that came into being. But, you know, and, but I was already living in Seattle by then, and it felt wonderful because it felt like I was coming back to myself, to my <coughs> Middle East self. I lived in Jerusalem for 13 years, then I was back and forth for a long time. Finally, I just, I, I, it was driving me nuts, you know, the political the politics of it, and so I had to get out. But you know, once you live in the Middle East, and I'm sure it's the same, once you live in Sri Lanka, it never leaves you, it's part of you. You can't, you know, there's that olive tree on my deck in Seattle. So, um, somebody suggested it, somebody came to me and asked me, said, I have, I, I would love for you to write a biography of Mary. And the moment she said it, I, it was like fireworks went off in my mind. You know, I said, as in virgin, just to make sure, right? She said, yeah. <laughs> and I said, as she really was, first century Palestinian girl living under Roman occupation, right? She said, yeah. I said, nothing like that satin robed, you know, diademed, you know, pale, figurine in the niche of the convent school I went to when I was a kid. And she said, yes, yes, yes. And I'm going, oh, God, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and somehow I, I knew that book hadn't been written. I have no idea how I knew it. And, um, and I knew that it would take me back to the Middle East, not physically, but that this was my way of being in the Middle East and outside at the same time. I could be in first century Palestine and in but then it was 20th century, Seattle at the same time. And this was just tremendously exciting. Um, and then after that, I wrote, and also, it was not planned. It sounds like, you know, God, what perfect planning. First she writes the book about the Virgin, then she writes the book about the harlot, you know. And I wrote the story of Jezebel, right, who's the big harlot queen of the Bible, who in fact was a magnificent Phoenician princess. And, you know, who, if she had any fault at all, it's that she was too loyal a wife. 
but uh, wonderful, sort of just, and it was, it, it felt like I was giving each of these women back to themselves, making them real again, and that the real story, as far as I could uncover it by using psychology, by using Middle East history, by using history of religion, by using mythology, by using anthropology, by using compassion, and you know what's called the historical imagination, by trying to put myself there, trying to, and also for my sense of place, having lived in the Middle East, you know. Um, so I know what it feels like, you know, to have thorns in your in your feet, to have the dust in your eyes and your ears and your nose and so. Uh, and I've lived with Bedouin in the, in, the, in the Sinai Desert, so I know what that's like, too. So it, it, was, it was just very exciting to be able to do that. And then, okay, then a friend says, I think it's time that you should write a bigger biography. This is a friend, another writer in Seattle. And he said, you should write a biography of Muhammad, and that's when I... <laughs> yeah, great, thank you, right. Next one, right? Um... But the next time we got together, you know, I'd been reading, because I, I was between books, you know, and a writer between books is a horrible creature. It's like an actor between gigs, you know, you're just restless and, ugh, and you're impossible to live with, and you don't know what to do with yourself. You know. um, so, you know, I'd read some of the biographies and, and, and uh, you know, the English ones, and, you know, I could not really understand how anybody could take such an absolutely incredibly dramatic life and make it boring, but they did. <laughs> they really did. It was what my mother would have called a snooze. I mean, how can you do that? I, and I could see that, you know, every single one of them referenced in the back Ibn Ishaq and Al-Tabari, so I went and read Ibn Ishaq and Al-Tabari, and that's when I knew they hadn't read them. They hadn't read them. They said they'd read them. They hadn't. Because in Ibn Ishaq and Al-Tabari, there was all the juice, all the vitality of real life, all the detail. It felt like being back there again. It was just, it was, it was tremendous. And that's when I really knew, you know, that I had to tell a story, but still not the story of Muhammad. That was going too far. But this was just after, this was 2004, and it was just after that whole series of attacks one morning in Karbala, in Iraq, Sunni on Shia, and the question then was, okay, no, how, how has this happened? How has it come to this? How, you know, we have Muhammad, the prophet of unity, one people, one God, how, the question put to me by a friend was, how could he leave behind him practically on his deathbed this seemingly unending legacy of bloodshed and division? And, and I knew that was a question it wasn't even a deceptively simple question. It was a deceptively complex question, but it was something I knew that I could really sort of get into for the next four years. And I did, and discovered this, this truly epic story. I mean, of course it's lasted so long. Just look at the story, it's so powerful, you know? Uh, but then, no, it, 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 okay, I won't go into it anymore right now. But, yes, we have three more questions. But the moment I finished, the moment I finished after the Prophet, that's which, of course, begins with the death of Muhammad. That's when I knew I actually was ready to write the life of Muhammad. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so three questions on that side. This one here. And then back here. Yeah, there, there were three there first. Uh, hi, Miss Leslie, we are happy to have you. Uh, I do research on Islam. Uh, so I came across this book called uh, The Hundred Most Influential People in History written by Michael H. Hart, who is an American. Uh, what do you think about uh, that book? Do you think that uh, Prophet Muhammad is the most influential person in history? My second question is, uh, I found that you had written a book about the Shia Sunni split. Uh -huh. Were the Jews involved in this? Uh, I'm sorry, what was Were it? the Jews involved in the Shia the Sunni Jews split? Involved. Of course the Jews are. The Jews are involved in everything, uh -huh. you know. <laughs> The Jewish plots, you know, to bring down the world, and the Jews should take control. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Come on. Okay. My uh, third question is, yeah. uh, how did the prophet die? Can you explain about okay. it? First of all, was he the most influential of the 100 most influential men who ever lived? Notice that that's men and not women. 
Are there any women on that list? I think it started out as a Time magazine thing. Does it really make any difference if I say he was the first or the second or the third or the fourth? Are we really going to make these kind of lists? This is a man who radically changed, as I said, his own society and rad is still radically changing our world. One of the most influential, most definitely. The most influential, I don't know. I, the Jews behind the Shia Sunnis. Actually, I thought it was the CIA behind the... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what was the third question? How did Muhammad die? Well, as far as I can make out, oh, you're into the Jews killed him? <laughs> um, the symptoms, and I, I checked this out very carefully. I called you know, as many neurologists as I could about him. Muhammad died, he was age 62, nearly 63. And for his time, that's a very, very, very long life. Um, the average life at the time was in the late 30s, the average lifespan. Now, we don't appreciate that nowadays. We really don't appreciate the huge changes brought about by uh, antibiotics, especially. Um, but it took 10 days. Uh, and every single symptom that I could, you know, that was in the early histories points, to, sorry, sorry about those peas, points to um, meningitis which was very, very rampant at the time. Uh, it was common all throughout the Middle East at the time. It still is, in fact, but now there's, there's medicine for it. There wasn't at the time. Uh, it involved uh, blinding headaches, extraordinary sensitivity to light and to noise. And the headaches, the pain went shooting up and down the back and the neck especially high fever that came and went until it finally got so high that, and the duration is usually about 10 days until death. Um, and it seems pretty clear that it was meningitis. Um, okay. What was extraordinary, of course, was what went on in the sick room during those 10 days. The way everybody was gathered there, the way everybody was trying to figure out who would be the successor, who would take charge of this newly united, nearly all of Arabia by now was newly united in allegiance to Muhammad. Uh, and in the idea of Allah as the one great God, but, but that also was not new. I don't think many people appreciate that, this, how much Muhammad brought in <coughs> other traditions, earlier traditions, right? Much, many of the rituals of the Hajj today were actually pre-Islamic. They, they, they existed before Muhammad, and he incorporated them into Islam. And this is this thing of inclusion instead of exclusion. Yes, we will bring you in. We will make you part of us. Yes, we will honor and respect your traditions and make them ours too. Um, where was I going with this? Oh, with the, uh, yeah. So, you know, I mentioned earlier that he didn't have a son. There was one son who died in infancy and that he never had any children with the late life wives, uh, only with Khadija. So by the norms of the time, if he'd had a son, then the son would have automatically been the leader, the successor, the Khalifa, the Caliph, eh? but there wasn't. And it was the fact that he died without, and this to me is what's extraordinary, and I do not, I, I don't understand it. I can only, you know, there's all kinds of possibilities and so on, but obviously, how can I possibly, you know, <laughs> dare to read Muhammad's mind? But, um, the Shia would later say that he clearly designated Ali as his successor, and Ali did indeed become the fourth caliph and the first imam of Shia Islam. And the Sunni would later say that he clearly designated Abu Bakr as the first caliph. But he never, though they bring up all kinds of arguments, 
I do not see any of them as absolutely clear designations. They're all somewhat ambiguous. There was never any clear designation. And um, so that sick room was full of people very, very eager for him to make the designation. And he didn't. Uh, so what followed was kind of, you know, it was, it, it was, it was basically the bloodline against consensus or kind of proto-democracy, it's hard to tell. It should have all come together with Ali, shouldn't it? It really should, the fourth caliph and the first imam. It should have all come together with him. Instead, what happened? He was assassinated, and he was assassinated by a Kharishi, by a refusenik, by basically a member of a movement who were the forerunners of Boko Haram, ISIS, Al-Qaeda. That's who assassinated Ali, and thus created the split. Okay. They will divide us. If they possibly can, they will divide you, me, they will divide all of us. If we let them, they will divide us. Leslie, I have two questions. Where are you? Hi. Hi. Uh, my second question will basically be uh, asked based on the red answer to the reply to the first question. I've heard you thrice now, and you're an agnostic, you say which means you don't believe in any formal religion. Wait, well, I'm, I'm sorry. You've heard me twice now, and I'm thinking, God, I hope I haven't repeated myself. So I didn't, no, no, I didn't no, no, hear no, no, the rest. No. So as an agnostic, you don't believe in any formal religion. Do you believe in the revelations to Moses, Jesus, and Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Do I believe in the revelations? As... From God? Ah. <laughs> Okay, what do I mean by being agnostic? It's true, I'm not a believer. I don't believe things. I really, really, really shocked where somebody who follows my blog once, she said, I can't believe you don't believe in anything. And it was on all caps and lots and lots of exclamation marks. And, so on. and I realized then that, you know, so, and she was dismayed because she trusted me. She'd put her faith in me, you know, she, she, she she wanted me to believe. And then I realized that you know, she put the emphasis, uh, the, the, the emphasis was on, it wasn't on belief, it should have been on in. I do not believe in things. Uh, I place my trust, I place my faith in certain things, usually in people, right? Uh, but things, I don't need to believe. There are some things that I know I know the earth is more or less round, right? I don't need to believe that. There are other things that I think, right? There are other things that may or may not be so. I really don't know. And there are a huge amount of things that I have absolutely no idea of and can only wonder at and stand in awe, right? But you know, one of the lessons of modern science, and especially of physics and quantum, quantum physics in particular, is that everything we think we know for sure is totally up for grabs. It's all a matter of probabilities, <coughs> right? There is nothing we can sort of put our finger on and say, yes, that's it, got it, ha, hold on to it. That's truth, right? And I'm very wary of the definite article of the truth, the meaning of life, the revelation, the etc. So this is what I call the agnostic stance, right? So if we bring things down to belief or unbelief, you know, atheists don't believe, theists believe, and so on, I think we're making the whole, I think we're making religion very small. I think we're making ourselves very small. And I think we're making whatever we think of when we think of the word God, which is, by the way, far too small a word, it's only three letters, right? We're making that very small too. We're sort of taking everything down to the lowest common, to this flat two dimensions of belief, unbelief. And what I want to do is get way beyond that. I want to explore and I want to wonder. 
And all those great existential questions of what are we doing here? And how did we even get here in the first place? And how can we manage to live with each other without killing each other? Wouldn't be a good idea. And what's the meaning of it all? And what happens when I look up at the sky? And how amazing that I'm actually here. How amazing that I'm here in Sri Lanka. How amazing that I'm talking to you right now. How amazing that my blood is inside my hand here. How amazing that these words are coming out of my mouth. I just, I mean, it all seems just grand and amazing and something to be inordinately thankful for, just life. And what I see so much it's another of the sins of fundamentalism, to my mind, is that it is, it takes the, it drains the color out of life. It drains the joy out of life. It says, okay, these are the rules, abide by the rules, right? Uh, there's no laughter, there's no joy, there's no poetry, there's no song. And you know, religion at its best is poetry. It's, it's the enigmatic, it's, it's what we can sense, what we can feel, but we cannot know for sure. So no, I do not believe, but I do not disbelieve either. <laughs> now my second question then uh, is, there are a lot of predictions in the Quran about what is going to happen. For example, on embryology, and it explains in detail, you know, the embryo and what happens. Uh, and many centuries later, the scientists have found out that what is inside in the Quran is exactly like what's happening. Yeah. What is your take on that? Well, you know, we tend to think, I don't know why we do this. We're quite arrogant as 21st century people, you know. We tend to look at the 7th century, and I found this also writing about Mary of the 1st century, or Jezebel with the 9th century BC. We, we, we look at people then like, you know, we're looking through a telescope the wrong way around, and made them very, very small. You put the telescope the right way around, and you realize that, wait a minute, first of all, people back then had a much better sense of metaphor and of poetry than we do, and much, much better memories, because things weren't written down. They were all, poetry was all poetry, right? History was all history, and they remembered. Their, their, their memories, were much, we don't need those memories now. We write something down, there it is, we can go look it up. People are amazed, you know, when they, I mean, the people in the West, when they see kids reciting the whole of the Quran, say, how do they do that? Well, it's a natural human ability. <laughs> Only most of us have forgotten it because we're so busy sort of, you know, on our computers. Um, what was the question? I'm sorry, I'm rambling. There was... Oh, yeah, I'm oh, sorry, okay, got it. So the clot of blood, right? Yeah, the, the, the tiny little fetus, clot of blood and so on. So we imagine that people were ignorant then. <laughs> we imagine that they were primitive somehow because they used herbal remedies, right? We who now use um, mare's urine in our contraceptives, <laughs> as they did back then, except then it was camel, camel mares. You know, nobody seems to know this, that, 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 that what all we're doing today with medicine today is finding artificial alternatives to medicines that have been used long, you know, herbal medicines that were used a long time ago. And that there was women in particular who carried on these traditions, the wise women, the healers, the midwives. Uh, people knew a lot more than actually many of us now do. Okay, um, so there's a question from the gentleman over there. And then we'll only have time for Madam, one more question. Me here, too. And then we'll, yeah, go yeah. ahead. Madam. I can go on. <laughs> Madam, you declared your being a Jew. Well, thank you. Are you a religious person or are you just a literary person? Am I a religious person? Are you religious or are you a literary person only? Um, I'm many things. <laughs> I am many things. No, I do not think of myself as a religious person. Um, I am secular. I am very determinedly secular. You, you have studied so much about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and still. 
Is it that you are still a Jew? I am a Jew. I was born Jewish. I will die Jewish as part of who I am. I'm Jewish, I'm agnostic, I'm a writer, I'm a psychologist, I'm a feminist, I'm a socialist, I'm a, I mean, I can keep on going on like this. All these are part of who I am. If you take away any one of these facets, I will be somebody else, I will not be myself. I treasure the Jewish part of me as much as I treasure any other part of me. I don't have to practice Judaism to do that, right? My values come from there, but you know, they're essentially the same values that are in all the Abrahamic religions, in fact, that are in every religion. You know, you've got the basic golden rule, do unto others, and so on, right? Uh, it's, um, and I have actually had many, many Muslims ask me, you know, how can you write so beautifully about Muhammad and not convert to Islam? <laughs> I just say, well, you know, I quote the Quran to you, your religion, to me, mine. That's simple. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. We have to ask the organizers. Okay, the last question. Okay, we got another one. Yes. Yeah? Last question, Amtish. Actually, you told about uh, social justice, uh, freedom, and uh, humanity, uh, Prophet Muhammad was uh, fighting off. Actually, uh, Two days back, there was a report by Oxfam that uh, I think eight individuals have more wealth than the half of the population in the world. Wait a minute, say this again. So you talked about... Uh, An Oxfam report that said what? Yeah, so Oxfam report says uh, eight individuals in the world have uh, more or equal wealth Oh, yes. Of yeah. the uh, half of the population in the world. Yes, I know. You're not going you're not going to make me use the T word, are you? <laughs> Please, thank good. Thank you. I do so, not want to use that word anymore. So, uh, do you think that uh, there is a plot uh, by the one person of the population in the world against the spreading of uh, Prophet's teaching? A plot by the one percent of the population of the world against what? Yeah, one person population is against the spreading of uh, principles of the Prophet Muhammad. Because when those principles oh, uh, are spread... That the, the, the one percent of the world is against spreading the word of Muhammad? Yes. No, come on. All they're interested in is money. <laughs> um, no, I mean, don't forget that among those 1% are quite a few who proclaim themselves to be the most loyal, possible, true, absolute Wahhabi Muslims. <laughs> um, you know, it does, it's very easy to see conspiracies and plots everywhere. And because, you know, it's convenient. It's a convenient explanation. And um, it's something I think all Muslims in particular should do with great caution. Because this conspiracy plot thing is now being used against them. And I say this, you know, as a Jew, I'm used to it. It's been used God knows how many times against Jews. Also by Muslims, by the way. Uh, and it's, this totally dismays me that there is anti-Semitism among Muslims. It dismays me as much as the fact that there is Islamophobia among Jews because the Jews have been through, in America, have been through what Muslims in America are now going through for very different reasons. It doesn't matter. It's still bigotry. It's still hate. It's still stereotyping. And they should be partners against this. And they're not, partly because of Israel-Palestine, but partly because people are just kind of, I don't know. We just keep making the same mistakes again and again. So I'm sorry, I'm sorry to end on that note. I know you'd like me to end up, okay. Can we take another question? Yeah. We've decided that we are taking three more, but just oh, one okay. minute, please. There are a couple more here, and then you, and then we'll be done, yeah. We can, yeah. <laughs> One, She's two, the moderator. And three. Yeah, okay. um, I would just like to ask the... about the research which you've done with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's life, including uh, the capacity of his influence with the teachings in the Quran. 
what you have gone through, do you find any limitations or any negative notions in the Quran which influenced the Prophet and there was something bad which the Prophet would have probably spread in the Arabian Peninsula or something like that, which is today taken as a negative thing by a lot of people who are having negative perceptions in interpreting the Prophet's life. Yeah, what I'm trying to ask is, uh, according to your research in the Prophet's life or reading the Quran, do you find any negative uh, attributes which you found in the Quran or in the Prophet's do life? Find yeah. negative attributes in the Quran? <coughs> I still don't quite get the question. Did you see anything bad in the Quran? Huh? That you saw some do I see anything bad in the Quran? Yeah, simply put, yes? Sure. Sure. There are violent parts in the Quran. Anyone read the Bible recently? <laughs> Lots more. You know, these are texts that came out of a different context. Came out of the 7th century AD, current era. Came out of the 5th century BC. Came out of circumstances that, you know, if we are unaware of them, we expect, because they become sacred texts, because we regard them as sacred texts, we want to think of them as perfect and as sacrosanct. Uh, and they have survived, they've come down to us, perhaps, as a, I don't know, I can't say, you know, but some, you can do textual analysis of the Bible and the Quran and, and other people's sacred scriptures, and you can see where human hands have come in here have shaped them and so on. I have no idea. Nobody has any idea that there are lots of theories why the Quran is arranged the way it is, except for the Fatiha from longest surah to shortest, more or less, right? Um, in fact, what I tell people in the West who are trying to read the Quran, because you know it's, it's, it's a difficult book, I say, you know, with all due respect, and not in disrespect, but maybe you should start reading it from the back, from the shorter, more mystical verses, the earlier verses in the back, and work your way through to the front, which are the huge chapters in which if you do not know the historical context, and you can't without reading the Sirah and so on, uh, you'll have no idea what's happening, and it's very, very easy to take you know, in the wrong way. You're asking me, do I think the Quran is perfect? It's like asking me, do I think the Bible is perfect? No, I'm not a believer. I don't think so. I find them fascinating and I find great beauty in both. And I find things that are not so beautiful too. Okay, thank you. Okay, the next question from the lady here. Leslie, do you think you. the fact that uh, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he did not have sons? And thus, there's this absence of a power hierarchy through lineage. Um, it speaks a lot uh, for me, in fact, that it left the stage open for women to be more proactive and to exercise their autonomy with greater assertion and oomph, if you like. But as Muslim women, I feel, that's my personal view, that we haven't. Why do you think that is the case from your point of view? You're asking me? Or? <laughs> She's asking you. Because <laughs> she was looking at you. Um, <coughs> yeah, why has it taken us so long? Not just Muslim women. Yeah. Women all over the world. Why has it taken us so long to stand up on our own two feet and say, enough of this? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, actually, for his time, it doesn't appear so great. I was trying to explain this to somebody in Gaul, so the Westerner, and she was looking at me like I was kind of nuts. I said, you know, for his time, Muhammad was pretty radical, you know, in his approach to women. She said, blah, 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 blah. you know, having up to four wives was a pre Islamic custom. So when they came to him and said, can we have up to four wives? What was the response, the revelation? It said, yes, you can. But only 
if you can treat all of them equally. And only if you can afford to keep all of them well. And only if you love all of them the same. And because you're only human and you know you won't be able to love all of them the same, better if you don't. <laughs> right? Um, the, and, you know, the women, the women in the story of, you know, after the prophet are just dynamite. Well, Aisha, of course, you know, is just feisty as all hell. <laughs> uh, Fatima, I would have, true, I would have loved for her to be feistier, but she was, well, who could be with, you know, <laughs> when you're on the stage with Aisha, you don't have much choice. Uh, um, Khadija is just, ah, oh, I would love it. You know, she died before Muhammad became a leader. So we have very little of what she actually said. I would love to have had more. Um, but you know, the same thing happened. You can go into early Christianity. Early Christianity, there were women bishops. Early Judaism, women took very, very powerful roles. And then what happens is that, with all due apologies to anybody here who's 60 years or old or older and has a long white beard, then the old men with long white beards took over. <laughs> and it's only now that we're beginning to say, hey, wait a minute, having a long white beard does not give you a monopoly on wisdom. Okay. It's way past two. <laughs> uh, hello, Leslie. Um, in response to a question that was posed to you by somebody in the audience. You mentioned that you were in awe of the world that we live in, the, the blood flowing through your arms, and so on and so forth. And uh, there were two words that I picked up that okay. you said, thankful for. I said what? You said, thankful for. I'm not getting it. Thankful for. You, that in, in, that, in that response, in that answer, you beautiful mentioned two words, words thankful for. What I would, I'm still the, not But you said you were thankful for the beauty of the world, the, the, you know, the mystery of the world. Oh, yes, for the world. Yes, yeah. I'm thankful you said for it. You, I mean, it's you, amazing that yeah, I'm alive. So, yeah, so the two words that I want yeah. to refer to okay. is uh, you said you were thankful for. The question I'd like to pose to you is who are you thankful to? <laughs> <laughs> you see, is that who, you know, like there's a person, like this huge concept that we have that we've reduced to just a nice intimate little name like God is a who? Right? Um, Do we have to be thankful to? Does thankfulness have to have a purpose? Does it have to have an object? Can we not just open up and sort of just be thankful to be here in the world? Let's see. <laughs> okay, yeah. L last question. Yeah, you have to speak loud because I'm not really hearing very well right okay. now. Hi, um, my question was uh, more related to again Prophet Muhammad uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his wives, uh -huh. and uh, just to, for you to brief upon your thoughts on uh, what you felt when you did your research with uh, Bibi Fatima, his daughter, versus Bibi Aisha, his wife. And what were the um, thought process as their characters and how they influenced uh, Prophet Muhammad, in which way? Yeah, uh, so how did the wives influence Muhammad? Fatima and Aisha. What? The daughter and his wife. So the the oh, we're talking about Fatima and Fatima Aisha again. And Aisha. Oh, God, this is such dangerous territory, and I'll tell you why. I got quite a bit of criticism about After the Prophet, right? All of it focused on those two women. None of it was about anything else in the book. 
And the Sunni said, I was mean to Aisha, and I should have been far nicer to her and respected her far more. And the Shia said, I was mean to Fatima and sort of relegated her to the shadows and sort of, you know, made her sort of far too insignificant a figure and should have given her a far bigger role. And actually, going back to your question, I think it's very, very interesting that all this criticism focused on the women because the women are considered the weak point, the vulnerable point, right? Uh, it's so much of the criticism about Islam by Islamophobes focuses on the women, right? Uh, actually, by the same Islamophobes who are now about to do their very best in the US Congress to take away women's rights, to take away women's health, women's access to health, and so on, by men who are actually waging a war on women are criticizing Islam for, its, for the status of women in Islam. Uh, the status of women in Orthodox Judaism, by the way, is just as bad. And then, of course, you know, what kind of Islam are we talking about? You know, there's no Islam as a monolith, and all one and a half billion Muslims worldwide think exactly the same way. Um, their influence on Muhammad. Aisha had more access. Quite simply, she had more access as a wife. And she lived longer. Aisha outlived everybody else in the story of the split. Aisha lived long enough to dictate, I've forgotten how many thousands of hadiths, right? Many of which were then later inauthenticated. But Aisha was the one who got to tell her story the strongest, as you might expect, because she was very outspoken. Um, and Fatima did not. And you can't tiptoe around here. You know, I can't change what actually happened. Should Fatima have had greater influence? Should this, this is not my role as a, either the teller of the story, as a historian, as a recorder of what happened, as even, as, even as a psychologist. My role is not to pass judgment. I, my role is to make it real, make the story real. That's it, thank you. The Value-Based Media Network.